Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. Before I start, I really want to thank the organizers and, and Anton in particular for inviting me here. It is my first visit ever, ever to Russia, and I'm very much enjoying it. Uh, uh, only the, the second day here, but I can say I'm, I'm, I'm having a lot of, a lot of, a lot of fun. So, what I uh, uh, would like to tell you about, what I would like to essentially guide you through in the next hour or so, it is essentially an overview of computational modeling techniques, and in particular molecular dynamics, and its application in structural biology. What I'll try to kind of combine in my talk is really some of the goals, as well as our achievements, as well as focus on some of the outstanding challenges. And in particular, what I'll talk about is two specific examples from our own group dealing with questions that hopefully will be of interest to, to, a, wide, to a wide audience. So the, the uh, uh, structure-function relationship, the idea that the structure of biomolecules is essentially responsible for their function, is one of the guiding principles of all of molecular biology. But really what one should never forget that it is the dynamics that essentially link structure with function. Just like with everyday objects such as airplanes or computers or bicycles, micro uh, macroscopic machines, molecular machines also need to undergo dynamics to execute their particular function. And then wouldn't it be nice... Next slide. Uh, so do you have to drive it or can I do it from here? Okay. Uh, so, so wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow have access really to a atomistic picture of the dynamics of biomolecules? And essentially what I'm showing you here is a snapshot, a very short snapshot from a typical molecular dynamics simulation showing the dynamics of two biomolecules, in particular a small peptide, it is a tripeptide, binding to its own cognate mRNA. So really there is only nine bases there, a very poor man's representation of an mRNA. But what I want you to focus on is really the wealth of details. What we are seeing here is the dynamics, the structural dynamics of every single atom with very fine temporal resolution. And if you think about it, if we had a picture like this, if we had a movie like this, a lot of biology would be much simpler. There is currently no experimental method that can give you this level of resolution and this has to be modeled. Okay? So these movies are deceptively seductive. They look real in some ways, but one should never forget that these are models. Okay? And you can imagine, from understanding the behavior of biomolecules to trying to manipulate their function, if we had an atomistic microscope of this sort, it would be tremendously beneficial and useful. So what goes into a movie like this? There are essentially four basic choices, four basic challenges that comprise a molecular model of this type. First, you have to choose your degrees of freedom. You have to ask and design what are the basic particles that are interacting in a model of this sort. Is this atoms? Should I include protons, neutrons, and electrons? Or can I maybe treat a whole molecule, or maybe just a side chain, as one interacting particle? So this is not a trivial, trivial choice. Then, what one needs to do, one has to say, how do these atoms, if you wish, of your simulation interact? How do they talk to each other? So one has to define a potential energy function describing their interactions. Then, what one also needs to do is somehow specify and control the boundary conditions in a model like this. Um, it's impossible to simulate the whole universe. In a way, what we have to do is focus on just a part of it. So how do we treat the boundaries of a simulation box? How do we control the temperature in the computer? It's trivial to do it in the experiment. How do we control pressure? All of these are essentially algorithms that allow us to get to the movies of, that I've shown. And then finally, what we need to do, dynamics is essentially equivalent to a generation of different conformations, configurations accessible to a given system. So what we need to do is we need to sample the conformational space in a realistic way. We have to generate a movie. So how do we do this? All of these points are essentially challenges. And I'm going to focus on two of them in particular uh, 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 quickly. 
So, the first question is this challenge of representation. Uh, what are the particles that interact in our models and what is the energy function? So, the uh, models that I will talk about uh, today mostly and the ones that we use are the so-called classical force field based models in which we describe the molecule using this potential energy function. So, this seems like a complicated equation but ultimately if you think about the physics that goes into it is relatively simple. Okay, so I'll break it down for you. So, if you look at this part, it is a sum over all bonds in which essentially the energy of a bond, of a covalent bond in our system is described as a harmonic oscillator. It is a vibrating spring. Okay? If you think about quantum chemistry, if you think about how these things really are, this is a very, very simplified representation of a bond. And you will notice here a constant. For every different type of bond, we need different parameters. We need the equilibrium length, we need the stiffness of the harmonic oscillator, and this somehow has to be parametrized. Then, all of the angular terms are also captured using a harmonic term. Torsional terms usually have a periodic function built into them. And then finally, what one has is the so-called non-bonded interactions, in particular a representation of Van der Waals interactions, and you will all recognize Coulomb's law here. Okay? So what we really have is a classical object of vibrating springs connecting billiard balls with given squishiness that can also interact with each other uh, uh, using Coulomb's, Coulomb's interactions. Okay? So ultimately it is a classical description, no quantum mechanics here, and it is relatively simplified. And then what we do, we essentially integrate Newton's equations of motion, or variants thereof, using Newton's, Newton's law, F equals uh, MA, using very, very, very small time steps. Okay? So, the, 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 one of the challenges in all of this is the, the, the how to get the parameters for the force field. You saw the equation, but it comes with a lot of parameters. The CH bond is different from the C double bond O, which is different from the NH bond. The same thing for all of the partial charges and so on. So the parametrization of a force field is a complicated endeavor, and it essentially combines quantum mechanical, more detailed simulations, comparison and fitting against all sorts of different experimental early measured values uh, coming from spectroscopies, then calibrating and testing your structures against known uh, 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 experimental structures and their dynamics, as well as using a wealth of different thermodynamic data to adjust uh, uh, partial charges or Van der Waals parameters in the model, typically. So it is a complicated endeavor that results in hundreds or actually even up to over thousands of different parameters that go into capturing that basic equation that I showed you. Okay? So to us, in a computer, the protein, the nucleic acid, whatever you have water, is essentially described using an equation I've shown. And then what we do, in very, very, very small time steps, we integrate Newton's equations uh, of motion to generate the movie that you have just seen. Okay? So, what is the problem? What is one of the key problems in this, in this uh, whole business? It is this challenge of time. Okay? If you look at the span of time scales involved in biologically relevant processes, for instance, protein folding or a conformational change of a, of a, of a, of a uh, protein itself, typical time scales that are involved for typical proteins are on the order of micro, uh, milliseconds or slower. Okay? Fastest proteins fold on the microsecond time scale, but no fold faster. Okay? And the problem is, is that bond vibrations, the basic physicochemical events in a molecule like that, occur on the time scale of femtoseconds, and indeed our integration steps are of the size of a one or two femtoseconds typically. So what that, that means is that we need to do roughly 12, 10 to the 12th integration steps to get from the basic event in our simulations to the stuff that actually as biologists we would like to uh, understand and study. Okay? It is a huge separation of time scales. And typical molecular dynamics runs on a typical processor. So this is currently no, 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 no fancy accelerations evolved, but your typical processor for a typical relatively small protein will get you on a reasonable time scale maybe 
tens, hundreds of nanoseconds, up to a microsecond, depending on the size of the protein, which roughly gives you five to six orders of magnitude difference between what we can simulate and what we would like to have. Okay, so one of the earliest examples of using computers was in the Apollo program, sending the rocket to the moon. And if you think about it, there the physics is much simpler. So one could propagate the rocket from the Earth to the moon. But currently, if those engineers had the same problems as we have today, they could probably move the rocket about from here to the Zvenigorod uh, train station and not to the moon, right? Five or six orders of magnitude in distance, okay? So how can one address this challenge? So there have been numerous attempts, both at the level of software, algorithms, hardware, to tackle this problem. And I'll just quickly focus on, on the angle that we have taken already more than 10 years ago. And in the group of Vijay Pandey at Stanford uh, University, we were uh, uh, essentially trying to harness the latent computational power present on the World Wide Web. There is millions, if not exceeding now, billions processors connected uh, via the World Wide Web. And one can essentially do and this is what we've done. We have set up a distributed computing uh, project, folding at home project, in which volunteers like you uh, and I from all around the world donate idle cycles on their machines for the purposes of running molecular dynamic simulations of the kind I've shown. And so far the project has grown to about half a million of different users all around the world. And essentially you see the map of them. The, the uh, dots are, are mapped to the closest uh, uh, capital actually. So that's why there is a big or, or a major city, uh, 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 big gap on this side. But there is many more users actually all, or, all around the place. So why I'm showing you this without going into too many technical details is just to tell you how challenging these simulations are. If you want to be competitive, you, want, you need a big machine, you need a big uh, cluster. And one of our answers to this was trying to essentially use the World Wide Web available resources to carry out molecular dynamic simulations of the kind that I've, that I've shown. So uh, what I what I wanna what I wanna do in the uh, in this talk essentially after giving you just a short flavor as to what molecular dynamic simulations are and what the challenges are, I want to actually focus on two concrete problems, on two questions that hopefully are of, of a wide interest. And they, in a way, are not typical uses of molecular dynamic simulations, but they're the ones that we try to take in our group, okay? And the first question uh, 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 asks a very simple, and you might even think a trivial question, but with hopefully interesting uh, repercussions. And that is what we are studying is the effects and artifacts of averaging uh, in structural biology. So what do I mean by that? If you look at this beautiful structure of the DNA clamp of the, of the polymerase that is in the PDB and probably you've all seen structures like that and, and we use them in our everyday thinking about how biology works at the atomistic level, essentially no one has really seen something like this ever, really. Okay? These things are even smaller than the wavelength of light, so, so seeing doesn't even make sense in this context. What these structures are, they're essentially models based on signals like this. This we've seen in the lab. This we've seen in the lab. Different spectroscopies, uh, diffraction patterns coming from crystallography. This is reality. And then what one does is one insertionally try to build up a model that is consistent with this observable data, okay? But what one should never forget is that these signals, okay, are essentially time and ensemble averaged in typical experiments, if not all experiments in structural biology. So what that means, when I'm generating a signal like this, I'm not really looking at a single protein with really, really high temporal resolution. I'm looking at 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 15th molecules, be it in my tube, uh, in my NMR probe, be it in the crystal. We are essentially looking at an ensemble of structures, okay? And two, what's also happening is we are collecting signals that are actually very complicated, typically functionally very complicated uh, 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 functions of the underlying geometry, okay? So in a way, we are somehow looking at shadows and trying to interpret what is the object that essentially gives this shadow, okay? And just to illustrate one of the challenges as well as the philosophy of, of uh, uh, 
our group, I'm showing something, a shadow of an object or, or, or a person uh, that, that most of us would recognize who it is and in a way immediately in our mind interpret it in a particular way, right? It is a shadow of so-and-so, Michael Jackson in this particular case. In a way we are looking at a low dimensional representation of an object and trying to interpret what's really behind it. And in a way everyone can do it, we do it all the time, okay? But what's actually interesting about this, okay, uh, is something that actually when I first saw it, it really blew my mind. It is a piece of art, okay, a piece of art by an artist, Diet Wigman, uh, a Dutch guy, that is essentially an object like this. It is a very amorphous kind of sculpture that if you shine light, shine light at it from a particular direction, it looks like Michael Jackson, okay? So, so what, what I'm trying to uh, get you thinking about using this is that sometimes, in some cases, okay, reality could actually deviate from our immediate interpretation of it. And sometimes even amorphous objects okay, can actually give somewhat ordered shadows, if you wish, okay? Let's just take it at the metaphor at this level and I'll try to explain what I mean through the talk. So, the question that we are trying to ask is what's really in a crystal? What's really in an NMR tube, okay? We have the structures that are resolved based on it, but could we somehow see what's really there, okay? And you can see that this could essentially have fundamentally uh, major repercussions on how we even think about uh, biological molecules. So the idea is very simple. Let's use simulations, okay, to generate all sorts of structures, okay? Sometimes they may not even be physical, okay? And then let's use physically known laws, okay, to calculate what would be the experimental observable based on that structure, okay? So we know what's really there, we know how the experiments filters that reality, and let's see what the observable looks like, and then let's try to ask, is this observable that we actually saw consistent, if it's consistent with the native structure or the experimental structure that's ultimately seen, yet it does not correspond what we really had? This will teach us something about the process itself. So we are testing and studying the process of solving structures and interpreting uh, 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 data that comes from the, from the lab, okay? So this is the principle, right? So we'll use the simulation as almost a tool for addressing these kind of questions. So the first question, the first little example that I wanna, wanna show you goes a few years uh, back and it deals with a very simple question or a very simple, simple uh, idea that most of you will uh, recognize. If you think about the structural motifs in biology, okay, in general, probably the number one motif would have to be a helix. A lot of things are helical, okay? So when you look at polypeptides, you have alpha helices, uh, pi helices, sorry for the, uh, when we moved it to a, to a Windows machine, I lost the Greek, Greek symbols. Uh, uh, pi helices, 310 helices, there are all sorts of helices in polypeptides. And even if you think about beta sheets, they're essentially simplified 2-1 helices. You can think of them as a two-dimensional helices. Of course, we don't have to mention nucleic acids from A helix, B helix in DNA, in different forms of RNA to different types of uh, helices, nucleic acids, the moment they are long chain polymers, like to be helical. Okay? Then carbohydrates, long chain carbohydrates, there is a whole menagerie of different helical structures. Okay? Also, non biological polymers. Whatever, it, the moment you have a long chain, it turns out, if you look into the book, they somehow like to be helical. And the question is, why is this? Where do the helices come from? One obvious explanation is the moment you have self-similar interactions, if one interacts with two, the same as two with three, I'm talking about monomers, you start getting a staircase, okay? So that's a very simplified uh, explanation if you think about hydrogen bonds or stacking in DNA, that's how one describes it. But essentially, what one should know when I talk about these structures, for these three groups of polymers, the most of the experimental results when it comes to long chain uh, 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 polymers come from one type of uh, structural technique. 
Okay, and that is the so-called X-ray fiber diffraction. So it's a type of a scattering experiment in which what one does is one creates a fiber which is kind of, if you think, almost a macroscopic semi-crystalline sometimes object in which the long axis of the polymer is oriented parallel to the z-axis of the fiber. And I'm showing a piece of coaxial uh, optical fiber optic cable just to illustrate what it looks like. So you have the DNA or the proteins oriented with their long axis parallel to this fiber and then you shoot x-rays at it and you look at the diffraction pattern. Okay, these are all very old classical experiments and one of the most important papers, early papers in theoretical biophysics altogether is a paper by Cochrane, Crick and Vaughan where they devised the so-called helical diffraction theory. What they said is essentially uh, uh, what would be the diffraction pattern what would be the expected shadow, if you wish, if the molecule were helical? If I have a helix, I will get a particular diffraction pattern. Okay? And if you look at the pattern, if you look at the paper, the, 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 the math is kind of complicated, but I will try to explain it to you on this basic, basic real data here. So does someone recognize what this is? Or do you all recognize what this is? What is it? DNA diffraction pattern. DNA diffraction pattern, excellent. So this is the DNA diffraction pattern uh, devised by, by Rosalind Franklin in 1952 that Watson and Crick saw, okay, and immediately interpreted it as, oh, DNA is a helix. Not only that, they even knew the parameters right away. And why is that? Because if you look at the paper I was just mentioning that came a few months before that, Crick himself had published a paper on what would be the diffraction pattern of a helical molecule. So essentially, the, the, the math goes through these uh, Bessel functions of the first kind. I'm not going to go into the details, but the basic finding was that if you have a helical molecule, what you will see is a pattern that looks like number eight or a double diamond with this typical helical cross in the middle. So if you have a helix, you'll get a number eight. Not only that, you will get diffraction intensities that fall on equally spaced layer lines. If you look at distance from here to here, it's the same as the distance from here to here. Then there would be one here that's missing, but it would be the same distance. This is the another one, so this is twice this distance. Essentially, you get these uh, uh, diffraction spots that fall on the equally spaced layer lines. And essentially what they could immediately tell is that if you count the number of these spacings between the origin and the first line on the meridian, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, uh, there would be ten of them. Essentially that gives you the number of units in, a part, in one turn of the helix itself. The math simply said that. Okay? Not only that, they could also devise the parameters of the helix if you take this and you take the inverse of it, that's essentially the, the pitch of the helix. How much the helix rises for one turn. And if you take the inverse of this distance, it is the, the uh, uh, rise per residue. How much does a, uh, uh, a helix rise per one monomer? Okay? So just by looking at this pattern, knowing the helical diffraction theory, they essentially could immediately tell, oh wow, looks like number 8 with equally spaced layer lines, it's got to be a helix, not only that, we can measure the parameters of it. Okay? So now the question for you, uh, do you notice a logical flaw in the argument I've just mentioned? Not a physical, not a mathematical, but somehow I've told you a story how essentially they thought about it. Does anyone notice a logical flaw in the connection between the helical diffraction theory and, and how I interpret it? Yeah, sure. Um, if we see the helix, then we see this yeah. pattern, but if we see this pattern, it doesn't mean it's a helix. Absolutely. So the connection is an implication. It is not an equivalence relation, right? So it is very simple. And of course, this was no secret to them, right? Uh, it was just that the only thing one could do is get the observed data and try to see whether the, the, the uh, predicted geometry actually pot potentially match whatever one is seeing. But it doesn't mean and guarantee that that's the only geometry, right? So, what we set out to do is essentially run simulations uh, of, of the uh, kind I mentioned before, but with a very, very simplified potential function, essentially described here. I'm not going to go into the detail, but what I want to say is that in our case, we were generating polymers, 
okay, molecules that were simply living on a uh, diamond tetrahedral lattice. So we have simplified the space on which these molecules can live. So essentially all we have is a lattice that expands in all of the directions and we are now putting little chains onto it. Okay? In an attempt to mimic something like a polymethylene chain, if you wish. A very, very simplified far cry from atomistic simulations, but allowing us to test some of the questions that I've uh, asked here. And then the idea was, let's generate all sorts of configurations using this particular uh, simulation technique. And then let's ask, what would be the sim uh, simulated expected fiber diffraction pattern if this was the object? Okay? And we know that because we know the physics of the experiment. Okay? So what we did is generated a lot of these simulations and I'm showing you here three different realizations of such a tetrahedral random walk. I could show you 50 of them, but these are really representative and what you can see is that they're in a way unfolded spaghetti. They're all over the place and most importantly what we could show because we have access to all of the details, that there is no helical residues in any of them. Sometimes you can actually get random turns, but even if you, if you look at these, you can see that there is no particular helicity to them. Okay? And then what we did is we calculated expected fiber diffractions based on something like this. And then the interesting thing okay, was that not only were the fiber diffraction patterns in terms of their salient features, all mutually similar compared to the uh, 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 diversity seen at the level of individual polymers, but more importantly, the way they looked essentially had the resemblance of helical diffraction patterns. If you are now an experimentalist and you get something like this, you might be actually tempted to say, oh, it's a helix, and I can even tell you what kind of helix it is. I count one, two, three, four. It is a helix that repeats every four units. Okay? And essentially, what one sees here is that there is no helix there. Okay? So this is completely in silico. Remember, this is not data. But what it is, it is in a way a toy play. It's an example in which we do the simulation so we really know what's really there. In the real experiment, we never know what's in the crystal, right? No one's made a little submarine to go see what's there. Here we can do it, and then we calculate what would be the experimental observables, and then try to see how they interpret them as an experimentalist, okay? So, what we could essentially show is that for 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1 helices, cylindrically averaged diffraction patterns of the kind that I've shown here, and I'm not going to go into much detail just to be able to tell all of the examples I wanted to, essentially report on the geometry and symmetry of the lattice on which a random walk is taking place. So we had this random spaghetti, but they were not really random. They were living on a particular lattice. Okay? And the diffraction patterns has nothing about helicity. Okay? It essentially talks about uh, uh, the symmetries and the properties of the lattice. And that lattice in real polymers is actually defined by the basic angles of uh, uh, the, 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 the polymers itself. If you look at the uh, sp3 hybridization of, of C's, essentially the tetrahedral angles are defined at that basic, at ba basic level. And then what one could show is that you get similar diffraction patterns for helices and random walks with the equivalent rise per residue and radius. As long as the parameters of this lattice on which the polymer lives are similar to a given helix, you will get similar diffraction patterns. We have worked very hard to obtain uh, a helix with 10 uh, uh, residues uh, per turn, but so far we couldn't find the lattice that would correspond to that. And this is in no, uh, by no means a critique of DNA being a helix. Uh, uh, we, didn't, we never went that, that far. Of course, the helicity of, of DNA has been confirmed in many different ways. It is just in a way a, a toy example telling you that interpreting experimental data is not always trivial with potentially major repercussions as to how we see things really below. Okay? Then in the second example that I want to show you, we essentially ask this question directly. How dynamic, if you think about a typical three-dimensional crystal, how dynamic are proteins in crystals? And then what we did, the logic is the same. We ran simulations of a, this was actually a, to date the largest crystal protein crystal ever simulated with explicit water and all atomistic detail, we had 216 protein copies. It's still a very, very, very small crystal. It is just big for a simulation. 
And what we did is we essentially calculated the, the full 3D diffraction pattern of a crystal like this and then put an experimentalist hat on our heads and calculated what would be uh, the structure that's refined based on this data. And then what we do is we compare this result, which is what you would get in an experiment, with reality, which we know. Okay, so this is a self-consistent experiment that's fully in silico, that still teaches us about the process itself. Okay, and in particular what I want to focus on is not so much structures this time, but the measure of dynamics that comes from crystal structures. So for those of you who, 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 who have, have, have studied and looked at uh, crystallography or structural biology, in addition to coordinates, a typical high-resolution structure also gives you the so-called B-factors. And B-factors are essentially related to root mean square fluctuations of the atoms about, around their average positions. Okay? They also report on all sorts of static disorders, lattice imperfections, a lot of stuff goes into it. But in the purest mathematical physical form, B factors tell you for every atom how much does it jiggle around its average position. And this is often used not only in understanding the, the, the function and structure of proteins, it's used also in drug design, in interpreting the entropic effects. It has wide, wide uh, 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 variety of usages. Okay? And it is simply a local measure of structural heterogeneity. Okay? So what we did is to make things more interesting in our simulated crystal, just because we can do that. With MD, we have full access, we can control every atom how they move. We purposefully made half of the molecule very dynamic and half of the molecule very static. Okay? So this crystal, the molecules in this crystal are not real, they're not physical. We are playing a game okay, in which we are generating a given level of diversity, structural dynamics on one part of the molecule and as a control keeping the other residues fixed, just so that we have an internal control for the level of dynamics. And we use that using different uh, position restraining uh, uh, position restraining techniques. And then what this also does, it made sure that our protein as a whole, just because we are keeping a part of it really, really fixed in place, that means that our lattice, crystal lattice, remains perfect. Okay, things don't go apart from each other. So we don't have these other typical contributions to B factor. So now we can really analyze what is really there at the level of atomic atomic displacements. And then what is uh, very interesting, and here I should point that here we could actually go to the resolution of one angstrom, which is very, very high resolution for a protein, and we got really, really, really high quality structures in terms of these typical measures of deviation between the uh, observed parameters and what the structure predicts. R and R freeze uh, below 6%. Six, uh, uh, 6 so we could really get a nicely resolved structure. And here you can see, for instance, one of the refined tryptophans in this model. Molecule. You can actually see the two holes uh, in the rings and we essentially got a structure based on this simulated crystal. And then what we did is we compared the refined anisotropic B factors. So this is what the crystal structure is telling us, the refined one, how much these molecules are jiggling. Okay? But we could then compare it with how much they are actually jiggling because we have that. We have that in our simulation. Okay? And the amazing thing, and I'm showing it here for uh, uh, two other residues, a histidine 27 uh, uh, and, 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 and a glutamine 26 in this particular molecule. This was villain headpiece, a 36 residue small mini, mini peptide. What you can see is that these refined B factors tend to deviate from what's actually there. And in some cases, for some well-resolved atoms, we could show that the difference could be even six-fold. Okay? Meaning that what one gets out of the refinement process is a number that is essentially six times too low compared to the true dynamic of the molecule. Okay? So due to the average, averaging and non-linearities involved in the process, as well as uh, unsuccessful or not good enough models of motion, that go into the refinement, okay, one obtains a picture that essentially does not correspond to reality. Okay? So both of these examples, if you, if you wish, are in a way uh, uh, cautionary tales. They tell us that due to the 
averaging as well as the non-linearities inherent in the process of interpreting crystal structures, there are examples in which what one gets is not really what's there. Okay? So, in the area of NMR, the questions of motional averaging have been studied for a long time. Just because one studies molecules there is in solution, and averaging is such a, a, an important concept. But in the area of, in particular, scattering techniques, this has not been studied in such a detail, and we are at least convinced that it still holds major surprises. Structures as we see them, and as we use them in drug design, interpreting structure function relationships and so on, may not necessarily correspond to what's really there. Okay? The same way an average face of all of us, okay, you will probably have eyes, you will have the mouth, but it will in very ma many ways also deviate from each individual one of us. And in some cases, and these are the dangerous ones, it may actually not be representative of any one of us. Okay? Imagine if this part of the room were cyclops, with the left eye, this with the right eye, the average would have both eyes, although none of us have two eyes. Okay? So, of course, uh, drastic examples like that are not necessarily present in, in, in structural biology, but it is something that one should think about. Okay? So, what, what the, the upshot is, and, and the message of this, is that in particular the dynamics of biomolecules could be higher, and this is still a hypothesis, it is something that one should not think how to break through these averaging problems in the experiment, may be higher than assumed even in crystals. And they could have important implications in different areas, in particular the role of entropy now becomes much more important in any kind of thermodynamic considerations. People have known that for uh, a long time, but how to link it with structures, with design, with manipulation is still open. And then, hopefully, what, 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 what I've shown you through this is that MD simulations can be a powerful tool, not just asking what is really there, and this is their typical usage, but also trying to understand our methods, trying to understand the way we are learning about things. Okay? So it's a very different application than typically thought of. Okay? Um, so this is story number one. Okay? And it is, uh, in, in, its, in its detail, very different, very, very different from what I'm going to tell you right now, but both essentially evolve molecular dynamics at their core. Okay? But in spirit, questions, they're very different. So let's switch gears. Okay? And go to a problem that is still considered to be one of the uh, uh, most important open foundational issues in all of molecular biology. Okay? Technologically, we, 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 we can do amazing things, but one of the fundamental questions is still open, and that is the question of the origin of the universal genetic code. With small exceptions and changes, it is truly universal, it is everywhere, but where does it come from? Where does the pairing between codons and amino acids come from is still open? Why does UUU code for phenylalanine, and why does AGG uh, code for uh, uh, arginine? It is not really clear. Okay? What, where does the alphabet come from? Is this just a dictionary? What is it? And there have been a wealth of different theories proposed over the years, starting from Crick's frozen accident. Pretty much Crick said, oh, don't look into the meaning. It is whatever we inherited from the last universal common ancestor, this pairing. So uh, uh, it's too costly to change it now, but there is no pattern in it. Okay, there is no rules in it. There is no explanation for it. Then Hagen Hurst, following actually a long uh, sequence of other people who have also proposed similar ideas, said, oh, the structure of the code is such to minimize errors. What kind of errors? If you look at the structure of the genetic code, amino acids that code for physicochemically similar amino acids, leucine and isoleucine, let's say, typically have similar codons. Okay? So the idea is, if there is a mutation in one position in the DNA, uh, what the system tries to do is optimize or minimize potential errors. Okay? So if there was one change, it's better, I want still that it's a hydrophobic amino acid, rather than changing now uh, 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 an isoleucine into glutamate, let me just change it to leucine. So the system actually minimizes errors when it comes to uh, uh, single site uh, uh, mutations and in particular when it comes to the hydrophobicity of the amino acids. So you look at the genetic code and really, 
hydrophobic amino acids have more similar codons than non-hydrophobic ones, okay? And then the last theory, and that's the one that, that I want to talk about today, is the stereochemical hypothesis, uh, which in this form was first proposed by Carl Vos, but the idea go back even to Gamow in the, in, the, in the 50s, which is the so-called stereochemical hypothesis that says long time ago during the development of the code, there must have been a direct interaction somehow between the amino acids and their cognate codons. Okay? They must somehow interact. And this is the basis for how the system evolved. Okay? And uh, one of the strongest experimental evidences so far come from Michael Yaros's uh, lab in Colorado, where he was looking at RNA aptamers that bind individual amino acids. So it's a scaffold, RNA scaffold, in which the binding site is designed to have really three bases that can vary. He generates a large uh, collection of such aptamers, and he saw that some amino acids, such as arginine and isoleucine, frequently, statistically more often than expected, have their own codons in the binding site. Okay? So it is seen for a few amino acids, one has to do heavy statistics, but there seem to be some hints of it. But what did Vos use? Essentially, back in the 60s, Carl Vos derived the so-called polar requirement scale, which tells you about the differential solubility of amino acids in pyridine water mixtures. Okay? So you mix pyridines with water at different molar ratios, you put amino acids in it, and chromatographically try to determine how do amino acids actually partition based on their mobility. Some will like pyridines more, such as leucine here, and this is dimethylpyridine, and some will like water more. Okay? And his scale has in the meantime also been derived using molecular dynamic simulation not only by others, but also in many, many different ways by us. So essentially what we are running, we are running molecular dynamic simulation of this experiment, and from it we have all of the details. These snapshots come from MD. We see water, we see dimethylpyridine, and we see how they partition. Okay? But why did Vos do this? Essentially what he did is he derived this scale and the idea was that pyridines are pretty good physical chemical analogs of pyrimidines. Okay? So let's derive the scale of so-called pyrimidine or pyridine uh, 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 binding propensity for amino acids. And these are the numbers. The lower the number, the higher the propensity of an amino acid to interact with, with pyridines. And you can see that there are major differences. Okay? Phenylalanine, leucine, valine essentially like to associate with pyridines. Aspartate, glutamate. Uh, lysine like to associate with water preferentially, okay? But when he mapped it onto the genetic code, and other people have done it based on MD later, he saw that amino acids with similar pyridine affinity essentially have similar codons. So he said, okay, there seems to be a major difference in how amino acids interact with these base-like compounds. So can it be that this difference was the basis of the genetic code, particularly because it's reflected in the genetic code? Okay? It was a qualitative argument. So the thing that we tried to do then, and this is the first thing that we've done, we tried to simply make it quantitative. We asked, how does the codon pyrimidine content I'm just counting U's and C's in the codons for individual amino acids compared with the polar requirement of a given amino acid. Okay? And what one sees immediately is something that goes in Vos's direction. Okay? Amino acids that have high pyrimidine content, FLPS, essentially have low polar requirement, meaning they like to preferentially associate with uh, uh, the, the, the pyridines pyrimidine-like compounds, and vice versa, okay? The correlation is minus 0 0.61, nothing to really write home about, but still qualitatively going in the direction. Those amino acids that, like pyrimidines, are actually coded for by pyrimidines, and vice versa. However, there is a lot of outliers. You can see tryptophan isoleucine here falling away from the line. Also because of different codons. Some amino acids have multiple codons with different pyrimidine contents. If you look at arginine here, it essentially almost covers the whole range of different pyrimidine contents. So depending on which codon is used, you can get something that goes with the hypothesis or something that goes against the hypothesis. Okay? So what we try to do is, okay, 
Let's now move away from codons and amino acids and try to generalize this to the level of complete mRNA coding sequences and their cognate protein sequences. So what we're going to ask is what is the pyrimidine content of a given stretch of mRNA and I will compare it with the average pyrimidine affinity that comes from this scale of its cognate protein. Okay? What could happen is, depending on codon usage bias, if these codons are preferentially used for arginine, for instance, I will get something, a correlation that's much worse than this. Also, if a given protein has a lot of tryptophans, this will be also a disaster. But if it happens that some of the other amino acids and codon usage uh, biases are seen, this correlation can improve. Okay? So what we're going to do now is essentially look at this, but at the level of complete proteomes. Okay? I take a complete proteome and I'm looking for every mRNA protein pair. I'm looking at the average pyrimidine content of the mRNA. Very simple, just counting using C's. And the average pyrimidine affinity of the cognate protein. Okay? And I'm showing it here for an archaeon, for a bacterium, and I'm showing it for, 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 for a human proteome. Okay? So the amazing thing that one sees is, one, that the level of correlation improves significantly to becoming almost quantitative. Okay? So what we are seeing here, let me just reiterate, I'm showing the pyrimidine content of the mRNA versus the experimental or computing particular, in this particular case, MD-derived polar requirement, average polar requirement of its cognate protein, and one gets a quantitative relationship that immediately can tell me, I can predict how much a protein sequence will like to bind pyridines in this very trivial, weird example, if you wish, from the pyrimidine content of its mRNA and vice versa. Okay? And this is true no matter which organism we look at. Okay? So this is now smelling much more like Vos's hypothesis, but at the level of complete polymers. You can almost think of mRNA as a bag, a pond of pyrimidines, with different level of pyrimidines, and the protein somehow quantitatively matches this. And the results are very similar, correlations are similar, whether one look at membrane or cytosolic proteins. Okay? What one can also do, instead of looking at an average for the mRNA, an average for the protein, what I can do is I can essentially plot the profile of the pyrimidine density along the mRNA and plot the profile of this polar requirement of its cognate protein and then compare the two profiles. Okay? So now, for every mRNA protein pair, I will get one R, meaning that for a proteome, I will get a distribution. Okay? You following? So essentially, what one gets for 15 different proteomes that one gets, one gets distributions that except in one outlier case, but which is not uh, 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 so tremendous mycobacterium tuberculosis, are all pretty much on top of each other with average values of around minus 0.75. So an average protein in a human proteome, say, uh, matches its mRNA in terms of this property with this level of correlation. So what does that really mean? What I'm going to show you on the next slide, I'm going to show you two proteins and their own cognate mRNAs. One, a protein whose level of correlation between the two profiles corresponds to the median of the human distribution. So this is in a way a representative mRNA protein pair. And I'm going to show you the best one. Okay? So let's see what they look like. So here I'm showing you a typical human protein and the best one in terms of this correlation. And let me reiterate what I'm showing here because really it is something that we are finding very exciting and we are working very hard to try to really see what its full implications are. Okay? So what I'm showing in black is the mRNA pyrimidine content. Okay? I'm just counting uh, U's and C's and averaging them in a given window along the mRNA sequence. Okay? And what I'm doing in red is at the level of the protein, the cognate protein, I'm essentially averaging along the sequence the affinity for these pyrimidine mimetics that they came from these simple experiments and in this case from the MD simulations. Okay? And the amazing thing is that even for the average or a typical protein mRNA pair, the matching between the two is remarkable. Okay? So let me just invite you to think that, that this is quite unexpected. We have two polymers, two biopolymers with very different chemistries, with very different biological roles, yet fundamentally linked with each other, that still 
show a remarkable correspondence in one particular property, in that the density of one particular groups on one of them quantitatively matches the affinity for precisely those groups on the other polymer, and vice versa. Okay? So this is the typical protein, meaning half of human proteome essentially gives matches that are, that are better than this. Okay? And this is the very best one. Another thing we can do computationally is essentially reshuffle the genetic code, generate random assignments to simply ask, okay, statistically, does one get this with the random shuffling of the, of the code? And we can do it many, many times. We shuffle the code, we calculate the level of correlation, and we simply count out of one million shuffled codes, how many give better correlations than the real natural universal genetic code. And actually it turns out that for half of the proteomes we have looked at, more than half of them, we couldn't find a single shuffled random code whose correlations were better than the universal genetic code. And even in the worst example, again M tuberculosis, the universal genetic code was among the 99.9 .9 percentile of the best codes. Okay? meaning one in a thousand or so, meaning that the universal genetic code seems to be optimized somehow to give you this level of matching. Okay? Uh, what we've shown here is the affinity for pyridines. Okay? What one would really like, uh, or which are kind of pyrimidine mimetics, one might ask the question, is the symmetrical situation also seen for purines? Wouldn't it be nice if purine-rich regions on the mRNA coded for the purine-loving amino acids. However, there was no computational or experimental scale uh, uh, for purine affinity of individual amino acids. So what we did is we went to the PDB and generated so-called knowledge-based scales, meaning from the known protein RNA complexes, you simply count how often does a given base come in the vicinity of a given amino acids, and then if you do proper statistics and inverse Boltzmann weight, you can get kind of the quasi-knowledge-based potentials telling you how much they like each other. And the really remarkable thing, and I'm just summarizing a lot of the data here, is that we could essentially see it also at the level of purines with some complications that I'm not going to go into. In short, if you derive the protein G preference simply by looking at protein uh, uh, RNA structure, the profile of such preference will remarkably match the, the mRNA purine content. Okay? meaning the inverse of what we've seen before, but now for purines, okay? Interestingly, A's behave differently, and this I can talk to you about later, okay? So what are, what are some of the implications of this, okay? So before I go into the hypothesis, I want to just show you three proteins that are kind of more well-known proteins uh, 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 with this regard, and this is really something that anyone uh, who can write a script, you could write a script in, in, in half an hour to essentially do this. It's data that's very easily checkable. I'm showing here hemoglobin alpha subunit, ATF3 and P53, and again I'm showing the mRNA pyrimidine content overlaid with the amino acid affinity for pyrimidine mimetics in red. And what you will see that in a lot of these cases one really sees a match. Okay? Here we are using this computational scale for the pyrimidine affinity, and that is essentially the link with molecular dynamic simulations. So you see we've come very far from just looking at movies to actually trying to learn something about basic biology. So what are the hypothesis based on this? Hypothesis number one, and it goes back to Vos, it was his idea, but he couldn't really uh, find evidence for it, is we believe that these results essentially give support to the possibility of direct templating of proteins from mRNAs in the era before ribosomal decoding evolved. So what does that mean? Currently, you have the mRNA, and to link it with a key uh, proper amino acids, you need an adapter, okay? You need the tRNA, okay, that provides that link, right? But Vos's idea was that long time ago, essentially just based on the physical chemical properties, proper amino acids would get attracted to the mRNA directly. And all you needed to do is just polymerize them. Meaning, I have here a pyrimidine-rich region, it will simply attract all of the pyrimidine-loving amino acids to itself, just based on physical chemistry, and then all you need to do is polymerize them. 
Okay? Of course, what they will lead to is the so-called statistical proteins. Wolves call them statistical proteins. Proteins in which leucines, isoleucines, amino acids with similar uh, pyrimidine affinity will be interchanged with each other. Proteins will be so-called, uh, they will have statistically robust composition, but individual sequences would vary. And this is also nicely uh, corroborated by the fact when people look at the age of ribosomal substructures, bioinformatics seems to suggest that the old subunit doing peptidyl uh, synthase job is evolutionarily older than the small subunit that does decoding. Okay, so that's nice because it suggests there may have been an era a long time ago where we had synthesis but no decoding. Okay. And then the second hypothesis, and this is something that we are particularly excited about. It is something that we are now even starting to try to test uh, experimentally, and we are also branching out uh, to do it uh, 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 in, in different ways uh, computationally. Is this, it may even sound like a crazy idea, but that's in a way the, the, the way that we can interpret this is, Remember, the, the, the sequences that we looked at here are today's sequences. This is today's hemoglobin alpha subunit, today's P53, okay? What we are suggesting is that today's mRNAs and their cognate proteins may be in some weird way physicochemically complementary to each other and bind, especially if unstructured. Okay? What do I mean by that? The analogy is actually very similar to the two strands of DNA being complementary to each other. That complementarity is embedded in all of our understanding of, of biology so far. But what we are suggesting is that the mRNA protein relationship might on some coarse-grained uh, physical chemical level have a similar parallel. Namely, the density of one groups on one of the polymers corresponds to the affinity for precisely those groups at the level of two polymers, suggesting that they might actually bind. Now, one problem with it is that here we have primary sequence profiles, okay? These are not structures. Typical proteins are structured. Typical mRNAs also have uh, a structure, at least secondary uh, structure. So, how does this complementarity come about at all? We are saying in contexts where both polymers are unstructured, there might be some kind of cognate, cognate affinity for each other. There's a lot of technical problems uh, with this. If you think about uh, it, so, so a question for you actually, what's bigger, a protein or the mRNA that codes for it? Hands up for the protein voters. <laughs> protein voters, well, just don't be shy, because I'm going to ask you who's for mRNA. Okay, more people for mRNA. Uh, it's it's uh, the, the basic uh, Russian uh, education might be better than the than the Austrian. When I ask this question in Vienna, I get about 50-50 answers. And what people say, my wife has a PhD in, in, in neurobiology, and this is in no way to make fun of her. It is just in a way to try to uh, illustrate how, how people think. The answer is typically, oh, mRNA is thin and proteins are fat. <laughs> you know, where does it come from? It comes from, the, from, from our textbooks, right? Usually, mRNA is like this, protein is like this. It turns out that the molecular weight of a typical mRNA without UTRs is roughly 10 times, 9 or 10 times greater than the, the, the molecular weight of its cognate protein, and that's without UTRs. And if you look at the contour length, meaning if you stretch an mRNA and you stretch a protein, the ratio is about 5. Okay, so the protein is five times shorter than its mRNA. Okay, so that poses significant challenges to this picture that I'm showing here. However, we cannot escape from the beauty of these or, or the strength, the statistical strength of these, of these correlations. So both of these hypotheses are still open and they are the outcome of this modeling work that we've done that essentially when reinforced with experiment. Our computational scales agree amazingly well with experimental scale, give us fidelity that there might be something there. Okay? And here I come to the end uh, uh, of, the, of the talk and hopefully I've, I've given you a little bit of flavor of what molecular dynamics and modeling techniques are about, what are the challenges associated with them, as well as two maybe unorthodox applications of MD simulations. Probably the more orthodox or canonical applications in this context of a computational microscope. Okay? The idea that drives our field is that in 10, 20 years, some people are saying maybe we are already there today, uh, computer simulations of this kind will be a replacement for a microscope. We will not have to do 
experiments we'll just look into our computational microscope because it will be so good if you think about how one today designs bridges or airplanes nobody really does an experiment with a bridge right to see if it holds or an airplane a lot of the work is done in silico why because we fully understand the physics behind it and there is no need for experiment so that's the idea behind MD simulations we are still not there primarily because of the force field issues, sampling problems, but that is the, 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 the horizon, okay? And then second, as I've said, sampling models linked with the experiment, these are all very open challenges that are very exciting and there is a lot of, a lot of issues there uh, to solve. But hopefully I've convinced you that in addition to these problems, or despite of them, simulation can still be used sometimes to tell us something new about the underlying biological reality and generate novel hypotheses. Okay? In a way, a theorist's day is finished when one has generated a good, testable, falsifiable hypothesis. Right? So this is, I see, one of the strengths of MD simulations, even more and beyond their more canonical microscope type uh, uh, applications. And in the end, I would like to uh, thank my group uh, 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 at, at the Laboratory of Computational Biophysics in Vienna, and in particular Antonia Kuzmanich, a PhD student who just graduated. Her work was in the area of averaging and, and crystallography. And then Anton Polyansky uh, and Mario Hlevniak, uh, the, the, the two really talented, excellent scientists, both postdocs, currently who are involved in the genetic uh, uh, code story, as well as our collaborators, Navraj Panu, a crystallographer who did the, the, the crystallography uh, interpretation work with us, as well as other our collaborators, in particular Vijay Pandey at Stanford, who runs the Folding at Home uh, project, uh, and uh, Wilfred and Ustaren in Zurich, who is one of the pioneers of the force field, classical force field type developments in MD, also the funding, and I want to thank you for, for your attention. So thank you for a great lecture, uh, I would say stimulating and with a proposal tip. I'm sure we do have questions. Yes, uh, thank you very much, it was really cool. Uh, I have a question about uh, crystallography. Mm -hmm. If we decrease number of molecules in a crystal, can we decrease also this variation? So, so are you talking about the simulated crystal or a real crystal? Yeah, so that I, I wouldn't dare to, 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 to talk about. Uh, in a way, what happens in the simulation, our big crystal is 216 molecules. So the smallest crystal you can make in the lab will still have at least 10 to the 6, 7, 8 molecules in it, even very small ones, right? So it's a very different order of magnitude, and my guess would be that it's, uh, I, I cannot really comment on it. What I can tell you is that in this particular case, if you go down to small crystals really in the simulation, what we've done, we've repeated these results with actually even just uh, uh, one unit cell. Okay, so, so there is eight copies of protein in one unit cell here. Essentially, we get the same result with no major change in the, in the apparent uh, uh, structural diversity. And the reason is that our simulation, not in, in addition to uh, 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 space ensemble averaging, also average over time. So even if I have eight copies, over the length of the simulation, they all populate different conformers, generating enough diversity. My guess would be, if you actually went even lower, to just one copy, and just look at a few snapshots of it, your diversity would actually go up, not down. Because the, the uh, 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 if you wish, the, the, the error of the mean would be greater, simply because you have smaller number of, of, of uh, 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 copies in it. If you think about average height in this room is much more robust when we have 100 people as opposed to two people, three people, right? Those with square root of n. Uh, so my guess would be uh, uh, that, that it wouldn't make a difference. But this is not really an answer to your question. And there I, I couldn't comment. I don't know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the third part of your talk. What about the atomic force microscopy? For the sake of the context, I have never seen an uh, atomic force microscope in my lab, so my question is purely theoretical. Yeah, so, so. I was 
Yeah, atomic force microscopy is an amazing technique. There are actually uh, AFM pictures of single uh, uh, DNAs that if you go and look at it, I mean, you will have to really have strong imagination and very revolutionary spirit to say it's not a helix. It looks very much helical, right? So uh, AFM is a very powerful technique. You can actually get to the level of individual atoms. The problem is how to fix them, how to interpret the, the experiment. And since there, you're essentially dragging a physical object on top of another physical object, the averaging artifacts are not uh, probably not so strong. You still have motional averaging and time averaging, but you're closer to the truth, right? Uh, but the, the resolution of typical AFM experiments at the level of biomolecule is still not good enough to give us anything close to crystallographic resolution. So that's why people, you, you don't have 3D uh, one angstrom structures of proteins done using AFM. But it's, 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 it's a powerful technique. Uh, I have a few, uh, question uh, what would happen to this mRNA protein correlation if instead of taking the actual protein of mRNA code, you would take a frame shape of protein, mm -hmm. which would all this. Right, so, so the beautiful thing about this, right, if you think about the frame shift, the, the pyrimidine profile stays the same, right? So I've shifted things by one and pyrimidine profile stays the same, right? So what this would predict in some weird way is that if you could translate a frame shifted mRNA, you shift it by one, of course you're going to get a lot of stop codons, but if you ignore those, okay, you're going to get a protein sequence that's very different from the original one. But the prediction of this model, and we've tested it, we've looked at it, is that they would still match. Okay, so that's a very interesting thing, right? Also, another thing that's important to, to, to uh, tell, and we are looking at it heavily now, since now we are comparing mRNAs and proteins at the level of these profiles, it's a lower dimensional the representation compared to the real sequence. So actually, if you look at the whole human proteomes, there are very different proteins that have similar profiles. Okay? So if you want to take this hypothesis to an extreme, then we should say, okay, those other proteins will also interact with the mRNA of this first protein. Right? Just because profiles match. So what we are currently looking at, we are trying to see whether proteins that have similar profiles Okay, although they have different sequences, are somehow functionally linked. Okay, which would imply, okay, maybe they really somehow talk to each other, right? But this is still too early to make comments. We have some very intriguing findings, but it's, uh, it, it's still not baked. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's really an excellent uh, letter because uh, it's. Uh, Particularly a very good instrument uh, for the genetic code, you saw uh, a purpose. Uh, but what do you think about the possibility of a similar clinical model creation for uh, some other clinical structures as a mimic uh, of uh, dark structures? And we will continue to for structure for the relations, for instance. And uh, about innovative templating based on clinical structures. As a mechanism of epigenetic or protocol formation of the clay minerals, uh, and, uh, etc., uh, in the frame of uh, ERA models, um, for example, early world uh, and uh, DNA world, etc. Okay. Thank you very much. So, I apologize, because of the feedback, I couldn't really understand all of the questions. So, correct me if I'm, if I'm uh, 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 answering a wrong question, right? So, so the, the first part was asking about biomimetics, right? It was asking about, you know, polymers that have, uh, 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 you know, biological-like properties, but they're not really biological. Like, you can look at dendrimers, you can look at polymers uh, 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 built of, of beta amino acids and, and so on. So these general principles would apply equally well there, right? So here we are essentially uh, uh, asking more fundamental question when it comes to the analysis of structures, which is how does the method distort the underlying reality? But it's more general, I would say, than just the, the uh, uh, nature of the real molecule below it. Okay, um, and then the second question dealt with epigenetics. In a way, does the second part, how does it relate to epigenetics? And also, I guess you mentioned RNA world uh, hypothesis. Uh, am I correct? 
Yeah, so, so one of the things that's very interesting, and it's another thing that we are looking at currently, is that if you think about the mRNA pyrimidine density profile, okay, it is the same as the coding strand DNA pyrimidine density profile. You just replaced T's and, and U's, right? So essentially what we are also trying to look into is can it be that the protein DNA interactions, especially action of some transcription factors, could somehow also be related to these properties. Can it be that the cognate protein actually binds to a piece of DNA based on these, these properties. When it comes to epigenetics, it, we, it's, I'm too far away from the field to really know what the, what the questions, real questions there uh, are, so I cannot comment on that. One of the things that we are looking at also here is not just mRNAs and protein properties, but also long non-coding RNA properties, right? Because if you think about it, what this is suggesting is a novel way of looking in general in protein RNA interactions. This physical chemical matching in certain uh, properties that could be equally applied there. And I know we've looked at some of the long known coding RNAs involved in fundamentally epigenetic processes, but it, just on epigen, I couldn't really uh, 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 extrapolate that far. Um, thank you for your excellent lecture. Uh, I have a question. Um, uh, why would you think that this mechanism of complementarity between protein and mRNAs could be so evolutionary conserved that it I don't know. It, it, it blows our minds, actually. I, I Honestly, I don't have the answer, but it is something that doesn't let us sleep at night, right? Because the question is, yes, it's in the genetic code. The sequences that we're showing were not some ancient sequence. That's today's alpha hemoglobin. So the question is, what could be today's function of these kind of interactions, okay? So there is, we, we just wrote one of the reviews where we've listed maybe five of them, but really we have a list of about 15 functions or purely hypothetical, okay? So one of the functions in which this could be important is translation control. And actually it is known, there is a whole list of proteins that are known to bind their own mRNA to essentially control translation, most often through feedback repression. For instance, uh, timidylate synthase, dihydrofolate reductase, even P53, a lot of uh, bacterial, in particular ribosomal proteins, spliceosomal proteins. There is a lot of proteins that are known they bind their own mRNA, so the idea is the uh, uh, mRNA is getting translated, it's producing proteins, producing proteins, and at some point, once it has produced enough proteins, one of them binds to the mRNA and somehow stops the, stops the translation. So that could be one example of a potential function. So the question is, is it really so general? Hard to tell. Second uh, potential uh, 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 application. We are again looking for a lot of contexts where both molecules are kind of linear. During translation, mRNA is opened up. We like that. At least then the profiles can be, can be seen. Another one that we are considering is viral capsid assembly. If you think about the, the positive strand, single strand RNA viruses, okay, are probably the simplest objects in all of biology in which the message resides in the close proximity of its product, right? The capsid protein and the capsid code. And one of the things that we are uh, looking at is the possibility that actually capsid assembly happens by capsid proteins directly binding to the, to the, to the message. Uh, experiments by, by, by Stockley in particular, these are very recent experiments, maybe one or two years ago, seem to suggest that in some viruses, indeed, the assembly happens by the capsid proteins binding loosely with low affinity at multiple sites along the sequence. So that could be one another example. Then the, 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 uh, uh, there is a lot of other examples that one can, one can think of. Uh, you can think of a basic chaperoning function of the mRNA. Can it be that the mRNA is some kind of a primitive first order chaperone for the proteins it produces? Okay? So essentially, by binding, it helps to solubilize them momentarily before the chaperones kick in, before the, the, the uh, folding starts occurring. Very hypothetical and probably not correct, because a typical mRNA produces hundreds to thousands of babies, if you wish, proteins, and it wouldn't be enough for the, for the whole thing. Then we have other speculations in the context of secretion, 
a lot of the proteins that show good, good uh, uh, interactions are actually membrane proteins. They show very good profiles. So now the question is, does this somehow uh, 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 happen during tr translocation activity into the ER lumen, right? Can it be? Also, we have some hypotheses about splicing and so on. I could go on and on, but really, we don't have an answer. And if the mechanism is really there, there should be some very, very, very basic function of it that's really there for most of the proteins. We don't know. Um, another question. Why didn't you have, you have your papers published in Nature? Oh, we, we tried very hard, uh, uh, but somehow uh, it's, uh, you know, if you think about it, the, 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 the finding is strong. Actually, having been in bioinformatics, computational biology for some time, I've never seen anything so robust. In a way, when we were picking these examples that I showed, usually you kind of have to show the nicest one. You go through them, you check them. Here we could do it blindly. You saw the average human protein really had nice properties. So it's something very robust. Why didn't it go? We, we tried. We sent it to nature and so on, but it's somehow, you know, it's, I don't think that's really the main, the, the, in, in science, at least to us, uh, it, we are so excited about this project, we could pretty much publish it in, in a local newspaper as far as we are concerned. It's, it's the, we are in the phase of this infatuation with the project, that that will change, right? But somehow, I think that should be the first driving force, right? We, we, we tried, we rejected, and somehow, these are still, if you think about it, very hy hypothetical uh, uh, things, right? If this were proven experimentally, it would be a completely different, different stories. But, so, we are not losing much sleep over that. We are losing sleep over your first question, not the second. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, two early questions. First, uh, in my curiosity lab, if I remember correctly, Arjuni was pretty much the only uh, problem that had uh, elevated uh, affinity to its I isoleucine was another one and actually there were also some depending on you have to do careful statistics and then depending on which level you kind of cut off your p-values you start seeing other things they also saw a lot of anticodons but arginine is one of the most dominant ones indeed well I don't know that's yeah. about, that's about one of the points that you have exactly about what you look at right? exactly uh, and uh, if, if there has to be some correlation between that and the strong correlation and also related you know I'm lost at how that <coughs> at about 0.6 correlations that you see at the per registry level uh, translate into the 0.9 of higher correlations that you see in the per on the protein level. Uh -huh. so is, that, is that due to averaging along the 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 uh -huh. or is there more? So, so let me address both questions which are both excellent. So, so the first question is, okay, experimental results at the level of codons amino acids tend to somehow be inconclusive. Things are not really binding strongly, there is no particular preference, yet what we see here is something very remarkably strong, okay? And where I think it's coming from, and this is where we are trying to shift the debate completely, is that if you look at about the origin of the genetic code and how people go about it, there is a, almost like an obsession with triplets having to bind individual amino acids. So code is essentially three to one, and you do things in the experiment, the RSS experiments, we're essentially generating binding sites for individual ones. What we would suggest is that these basic preferences are essentially so weak that what you need is a polymer to, in a way, cooperatively add up the interactions of, of many little contributors to essentially give you a big, bigger effect. Essentially, our effect, what we are claiming, really occurs at the level of complete polymers. It's the same with DNA. If you put just the, the adenine and uracil alone in the soup, okay, in some cases you will essentially uh, see proper uh, hydrogen bonded dimers, but you also see all sorts of different things. You also see, you know, GA base pairs, hydrogen bonds, all sorts of things, right? The true complementarity between DNA strands comes only when they're polymeric. So we are suggesting it is the same thing there, okay? So uh, genetic code itself is the beginning of the story, but more interesting thing is that this density of groups that cooperatively reinforce each other that essentially leads to the, to the agreement. If you think about it, when we looked at individual amino acids, the correlation is still 0 0.6. If you square that to look at the degree of variance, 36%, okay, who knows, is this strong, not, and so on. 
profiles are much stronger. Okay. So the second question is where does the strength and the improvement come from? It comes from two effects. Okay. The first effect is codon usage bias seems to, in humans, in all of these uh, organisms, seems to be rigged in such a way to essentially improve the correlation. If you actually go, so now I'll zoom quickly to here, if you go to this picture, if for instance, arginine is a good example, RRR, okay? If a given organism preferentially has these Rs, meaning the codons with low pyrimidine content, they will improve the correlation. If it uses these guys, it will worsen the correlation. It turns out that it tends to use the ones that improve the correlation. What we have done is we have actually managed to recode the complete mRNA dome so that it still codes for the same proteins. Right? So we can now pick different codon usage biases to still code for the exact same 18,000 annotated human proteins and we can move this distribution from 0.75 to about 0.2. We can essentially destroy the correlation if we generate mRNAs with different codon usage bias. So that's part one of the answer. And part two of the answer is that depending on which amino acids are preferentially present in a given organism, the correlation can get better or worse. Okay? The amino acid that's probably the worst in this correlation is tryptophan. Okay? It has high pyrimidine affinity, but it actually has relatively low pyrimidine content, right? Yet, tryptophan is the least abundant amino acid, you see? So, essentially, if you had a proteome that's completely built of tryptophan-based proteins, you would actually get a correlation that's even worse than this, okay? So, codon usage bias and amino acid composition, as well as averaging, lead to the improvement of this kind. And it's very interesting, right? Because it seems that codon usage bias contributes to this. Well, may, may I make a, a, a tiny comment? Absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, regarding, uh, I have nothing against the tryptophan. Sure. But uh, regarding common wise, uh, you're essentially saying that the uh, 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 pyrimidine or lipidized usage on a, uh, 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 in Sorry, in synonymous positions, it's correlated uh, with uh, what you see in the non-synonymous positions, right? And that's a correlation that is there in the human genome, at least, uh, mm -hmm. that is well known. There mm -hmm. are isophores, and in, for example, 40% GC level positions mm -hmm. of the genome, you see both enrichment uh, of uh, A's and T's in the third, third positions, mm -hmm. but also you see preferential usage of amino acids mm -hmm. that are enriched uh, mm -hmm. with A's. So, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that this correlation between uh, the, 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 the columns basically are tend to be either GC rich or AT rich, uh, and if they are GC rich, the, the, the entire columns tend to be GC rich, and that contributes to your correlation. But there can be lots of different causes uh, for these effects, and the most uh, commonly believed. Uh, Cause is the uh, is the uh, 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 bias gene conversion, which which contributes to the differential levels of GC content over G the genome. Yeah. So, 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 so essentially what, what I should uh, emphasize these two things. The first one is I never said that this is the sole effect, the sole cause of it. So there could be all other things happening. Yeah. mRNA with this alphabet, with four letters, is so uh, uh, informationally rich that you could in parallel store five different messages, so to speak, physical, chemically or biologically important functions in the same sequence. You can optimize it that way. But the second point is, and I would strongly disagree with that, because if you think about it, GC content, okay, or AT content, has nothing to do with pyrimidine content, okay? GC content essentially equally increases the pyrimidines and purines. G, purines, C, pyrimidines in a given codon, right? So there is no correlation between the pyrimidine content of a codon and its GC or AT content, because you're changing both variables at the same time. Right? So, in a way, GC content, of course, what you're mentioning is all absolutely correct. What we are just suggesting is that this is existing on top of it with a slightly different alphabet. Okay? GC content is something that people look at all the time. And it's remarkable that pyrimidine content is a number that's much less studied. 
it's a funny thing. I don't know. When I, if you do bioinformaticians, everyone immediately looks at GC content, and it's easy to see why. There is a physical uh, explanation as to the stability of the DNA and so on, and then that has a whole host of repercussions. But if you try to find studies of variations on pyrimidine uh, or, or purine content, I would say it's 10 times less focus for some reason. We can discuss it later, but, but somehow GC content, I don't think it's at all related to this, right? GC content of a codon is the same here as here. It's the pyrimidine content or purine content that matters. No, I'm just saying that any nucleotide level biases will contribute to, to GC, if you understand it correctly. Uh, they could. They could. We are in a way looking at it from backwards. We just have a phenomenon and we are trying to see what it depends on, but it could depend through different processes. Hmm. All right. Um, I'm sorry, just uh, last, last one question to you. Uh, I think you thought much about experimental validation of uh, the complementarity between proteins and, mm -hmm. and the mRNAs. And can you give us just brief insight how this would be executed in the lab? I mean, what would it my Yeah, so if you think about it, it's, we, we are making a very simple hypothesis, which is that the uh, mRNA and its cognate protein will bind if the two are unstructured. Okay, so you can do calorimetry, you can do structural things. One of the things that we are trying to do is simple gel shift assays. So if you want to look at simplest binding of proteins to, to RNA, you do a gel shift. You see whether, whether they bind. The problem is that based on the, on the numbers that we have, we have no idea about the affinity. We don't know if they're at all whole. Are these high affinity complexes, low affinity, what's happening? So what we are trying to do is essentially use thiouracil based UV cross-linking to cross-link the partners. So you introduce thiouracil instead of use, you cross-link them with UV, so you kind of fix the complex if it is there, so it wouldn't fall apart in the, in the gel shift or whatever you do. And what we are trying to do, we are trying to essentially destabilize the two partners to see whether the level of denaturing would somehow contribute to binding, right? It, we still don't exclude the possibility that what we are seeing here somehow translates into binding of 3D structures. We just don't have the code. The simplest way to interpret it is at the level of individual sequences. So we are using uh, uh, denaturing with chemical denaturants or temperature denaturing of both proteins and RNA to start to look at these things. But one can think of all sorts of different ways of detecting these complexes. And in particular, what one would like to focus is unexpected binders. You know, ubiquitin or alpha hemoglobin subunit binding to their own mRNA, right? If you look at HFQ or proteins like that that are known to bind RNA, no one will be surprised. Uh, the prediction of this is that a large number of you know, actin or, or you know, uh, typical proteins will bind. But that's in a way the experiment that we are trying. You can try to do thermophoresis, calorimetry, NMR. What, there, there is a lot of things one can try. For those of you who want to ask further questions, both speakers will be back with us for dinner, so you will have a chance to catch up with them later today. So let us again thank Boren and Mark.